So how many folks have already used Docker in some form or fashion at this point? Okay, a little more than half of you, or about half of you, that's good. We're not, we're not here to do a Docker tutorial. This is a little bit more advanced, right? More behind the scenes, if you will, and what, what the, how the JVM behaves on Docker. Uh, but you'll see plenty of Docker commands go by as we get into the demonstration mode. Okay, but I'm going to move pretty quickly, and I tend to talk really fast, especially if I've had too much coffee. So I will try to make it, you know, articulate, right? I'll try to slow down enough. But let's go and dive into this. I'm super excited to be here in Barcelona in particular. It's the first time I've ever been in Barcelona, first time I've actually been in Spain. And so it actually is a very picturesque city. We had a nice trip for the speakers out on the ocean on this past Sunday. It was really awesome. And so I have really enjoyed just being part of the city and part of the culture here. Certainly it's uh, from a welcoming standpoint, it's been very welcoming. But you guys are very proud of your football club, right? Well, I hope so, right? You should be very proud of the football club. And in my case, I actually coach soccer. We call it soccer in the U.S. because you know, we don't use our feet for something else or something. I don't really get it. But um, I coached soccer for 14 years. I coached football for 14 years. And I also ran a program specifically for little kids. And so I probably, put, I probably coached several hundred kids as well as put several thousand kids through the program as, a, as the program administrator. I was the director of girls' soccer for a long period of time. So I coached mostly girls. I did boys for a little while, too. Um, so I really appreciate the game, and I really appreciate the culture that surrounds the game. And I, and I know you guys got Neymar and Messi, and then, um, or Messi. And then you have that guy who bites people too, right? Yeah, that's cool. So, you know, you guys obviously have a lot of cult, uh, you know, significance in this area, and I appreciate that. And when I was flying into Barcelona, I noticed something about the city. And as far as when you're above it, you kind of notice something. You notice that there's all these shipyards and container ships. And we're here to talk about containers today. So it's actually very appropriate we're going to talk about containers because we're going to specifically talk about Docker, which is the most popular container image, the most popular uh, container-related technology that's out there. There's others, but this is the one that pretty much everyone uses right now. And it is the one that Red Hat specifically supports for customers today. And so we're going to focus on Docker. And you notice the image of the Docker logo also is kind of a container ship, or containers on a whale. And so you can think of the container ship as the way to support all these individual containers. But you can put all kinds of neat things in your container. Okay, and that's where this gets a little bit tricky. So we're going to really hopefully explain this and make some sense of it. Now, think of an empty container. You can easily put anything you want into it that runs on Linux, right? There's working on Windows containers and there's some work being done in that area, but by default, it's a Linux-based technology. And you can put pretty much anything that runs on Linux inside it. However, you have to decide, does it behave well? So does our Java behave well in a container? Or does it think it's actually in jail? And right now, it thinks it's in jail. If you treat it with default parameters, it's in jail, and it blows up. So we're going to show you that, right? We're going to make it go boom. Um, but if you treat it well, he's still in his container, but he might be at the beach having some you know, mojitos, having a good time. So just keep that in mind. So let's keep going here. There's some really big wins for developers when it comes to container technology. It's a highly portable format for packaging up your applications at all its dependencies and hopefully moving it through the entire deployment pipeline from development to you know, QA, QE, staging, production. That kind of concept is what the, the promise of this technology was all about. Super lightweight, encapsulates a virtualization-like technology, but they're actually very different from virtual machines. And that's where you kind of get sideways on this. A lot of people say they're lightweight VMs. I'm sure I probably said lightweight VMs at some point in the last few years that I've been talking about Docker. But they're really not lightweight VMs, and they don't behave as such. And so you will see that when we get into the demonstration portion as we get through this slide deck. Okay? But one thing that's super awesome about the technology, I believe, is you don't have the scenario where it works on my machine. This helps eliminate that. And that might not be a problem for you and your teams. I can tell you that when I work at Red Hat, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> So some engineer says, but it works on my machine. And it's like, great, what kind of machine do you have? And what, how's it configured? And what are all the dependencies that you loaded in to make it actually work? And we go back and forth. And if they live a long ways away from me, which almost every engineer at Red Hat does, because uh, most people work out of their homes around the globe, it'll take you about two or three days of emails to figure out what the hell they've done to configure their machine. And if everyone used Docker and, and codified that in the Docker file, it's vastly easier. Okay. So your dev environments can match your production environments pretty well. Your dev environments can match other dev environments, and that's a huge win. You can spin up a new dev environment in moments if you have everything set up correctly. So it's a, there's a lot of wins for developers here. And of course, you can have everything running nicely, neatly, in a big container ship. But if you do it poorly, it starts working like this. And it will collapse on you. 
you should just keep that in mind. That's where we're going to focus on. So one thing that's very different about virtualization versus containers is there's a shared kernel on those containers. In our VM world, right, they all have their own individual operating system. They can actually be very different operating systems. You can have a, a Windows base and a Linux uh, guest, right? So Windows host or Linux guest and vice versa. But in a container world, it really needs to all really be the same kernel. Implement. It is all sitting on the same kernel, and it really ought to be the all, all the same distribution of Linux. So a lot of people think, oh, I can just mix and match all these different Linuxes. Yep, we wouldn't recommend that from a Red Hat standpoint. Right? It needs to be a Linux that you actually know and understand and have it soup to nuts all the way vertically through that stack. Because if there's kernel differences, you will find things that blow up. Okay? Now, in this specific case, I put Docker on the side. Docker is not a layer per se. C groups and namespaces are the layer. Docker is, a, think of it as a management tool, an orchestration tool, a solution that wraps these things and makes it easier to work with. And we'll kind of dive more into that as we go. Okay? So, super fast, super lightweight. So uh, really nice from an immutable image standpoint. You know, if you think way back in the old days of Java E and J2E, as we used to call it many, many years ago, right? We had the concept of the ear and the war, and you could basically say that was your image, if you will, of all your package software, and you can move that through your deployment pipeline. We had the concept of the deployer role, right? That person who was responsible for actually running it in production. But we learned that it actually that package wasn't pure, if you will. Sometimes it does rely on certain operating system capabilities. Sometimes it does have all this additional configuration around it. We'll talk about that more in a second. One thing Docker does very nicely, though, is it caches the layers as it does its build. And so that's something that's unique to Docker, or different than, let's say, other uh, container formats. And then it builds really fast, too. Now, it's not a real VM. It's just another process running on the operating system. If you actually have access to the host, you'll, you can, when you do a PS, you'll see all these processes. You've got to keep that in mind. So anyone with access to the host has a, can see everything inside that container. Right? It's a leaky abstraction, if you will, if you think of it from the way we talk about things in a Java universe in many cases. It's not perfectly portable. So we think it is, it feels like it is, but it's not. So just keep that in mind. You really do need to test it in the environment in which you intend to run it. And we're going to prove that point when we get into the, deeper into this presentation. Okay? Oh, one good point, too, also the lineage of Docker images at Docker Hub. You don't know who built those things. Okay? And there's dozens, of, well, there's something like 30 to 40% of them have known critical vulnerabilities inside them. They've not been patched, they've not been updated. You know, I don't know how many of them have heart bleed or shell shock or whatever, but there's tons of gotchas in some of these images because you don't know where they came from. So you need to keep that in mind too. In many cases, if you're a big corporation, you're better off building your own images, quite honestly. And that way you know exactly what went into them, as an example. Okay? Now, the history of containers. A lot of people think this whole thing happened in the world of Docker. But it actually started a decade, or actually 13 years earlier than that, with the concept of BSD jails, right? We had the Solaris zones. We had the concept of control groups happened in 2007 specifically. And then you can see that different things were happening in the Red Hat universe as well as the overall Linux and Unix universe. And then Docker really happened in 2013. It's really awesome what happened with Docker, right? It was an organization that basically was changing its business model, if you will. They weren't doing too well in their previous business model. So, so they decided to open source something. They did a five minute presentation at a Python conference and the rest is history. They went supernova from one little lightning talk, as an example. When they showed the world Docker build, Docker run, it lit the world on fire because no one had ever seen anything like that before. But all that is is sitting on top of C groups and namespaces, which is an underlying Linux capability. Okay, uh, so we're gonna keep going here. Now, here's the thing that's important about that lineage, right? In 2000, when this thing really got started, uh, Java pre-existed, and most things pre-existed. That's why Java doesn't behave well in this new containerized world. And it's something that Red Hat and Oracle have been working really hard on over the last several years uh, to really understand how to make it behave better. And it's imperfect, and we're going to show you those imperfections so you don't get burned by them. Is that cool? Okay, we'll keep going. It's going to look like this if you don't do it well. And actually, if you just take the default options on the JVM, it will look like this. You will get burned. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll kind of hopefully make that point when we get into the actual demonstrations. The challenge you might have, though, as a developer is that you've had to articulate the configuration of your application of your entire stack. Now, we have the dependencies for the Java standpoint in the Palm XML, the Maven, the Maven Palm, right, or the Gradle build, whatever you want to use. The build, hopefully, the build file, defines the Java dependencies. But we have a lot more dependencies for our application. We have configuration at our app server level. Right? We have data source configuration, JMSQs and topics, user IDs and passwords. We have all these kinds of things that have to get configured. And we also have to do them well or our application doesn't run. 
And I'm sure people here in the room have actually been burned on that. Because you wrote a really nice email to somebody that said, hey, my app needs this, 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 and this. And they read the email, and they tried to configure your application in the QA environment, and it failed. Because you forgot to put an instruction in that email. Now, hopefully you didn't use the email to also manage your source code. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but there's probably someone still in this room using email as their source code uh, control repository and versioning system. I mean, it just continues to happen throughout the industry. But this concept of configuring the JVM to the right parameters with the right version, configuring the operating system with the right dependencies to the right versions of everything, all that has to get done. And the nice thing about the world of Docker is it all puts this in a nice Docker file instead of a nice email. Because when it comes to a development environment, you have a Windows workstation. Most Java developers have a Windows workstation, right? And they're, it's corporate standard. That's what they have to use. They might have Java 8 on there because that's what they wanted, uh, assuming they were sneaky and got around the corporate standards and did an install when they weren't supposed to. And they might have, you know, let's say, like uh, an open source app server. That's fairly common. I've seen this for many, many years of myself as an example. They might have MySQL or something else, but the production environment is very different from that. And so the idea of the Docker file helps you make this a little more streamlined. And more importantly, it's a coded artifact that's checked into source control and goes to the build pipeline and comes out the other end, hopefully with the right image that you want, the nice immutable image that moves to that pipeline. So this is kind of what a Docker file might look like. And I just tried to put it here in a, uh, from a picture standpoint. But you say where it's from, the base OS, what you want from an app server or underlying capability. It doesn't have to be an app server. And actually, most of the stuff I'll show you today was with fat jar architecture. Uh, but any kind of configuration parameters, data sources, uh, JWC connection pool, to, you know, whatever jar file you need from a database connection. And I wouldn't actually recommend doing it this way. This is just an example of what you could do. Okay? And this is all the, kind of the power of Docker, and this is what makes it so amazing. Now, it gets super interesting in this Docker world, though, not when we just build one container, but when we're building dozens, if not hundreds, of containers. And for those of you thinking, I'm going to be doing microservices soon, you're going to be doing dozens, if not hundreds, of these things going forward. Otherwise, how are you going to manage, you know, let's say, 100 application stacks out there in the wild when it's hard to manage one today? Right? So if you go on microservices and you're saying, look, I'm going to go from one app to 100 apps, you've got to have some more management infrastructure around it. Right? It's just going to take more effort. And so the neat thing about it is all this Docker stuff is really sitting on top of the base Linux kernel. It specifically uses these capabilities, something called cgroups, which we mentioned earlier in the history. And cgroups specifically, it's using the CPU right, and memory constraints. That's really what we focus on here. Specifically, I can constrain CPUs to either specific pinned CPUs on the host, like I only want CPU 1 or CPU 0 or CPU 0 and 1, as an example, or CPU shares. And there's different ways to calculate CPU shares. And so it can basically determine, as a, at the Docker level, you know, what kind of CPU resources it thinks it needs. It also can define its memory resources. And if you're going to do Docker, you need to put these constraints on the Docker container. If you're just doing Docker run with no constraints, why are you even doing Docker? Right? These constraints matter, and that's why you're doing this kind of thing. You're basically saying, oh, this guy, this little application here, needs uh, 200 megs of RAM and needs one CPU, as an example. But you should think, keep that in mind, because from a JVM standpoint, it behaves differently under those constraints. You can actually switch it from server mode to client mode pretty easily by accident. And then you've got a completely different just-in-time compiler architecture in that case. You've got a different memory configuration. A lot of weird things happen if you're not paying attention. We're going to dive into those. Um, we'll also talk about memory, the memory one, and we'll poke around in there. And then namespace is basically is just how all this is controlled. So everything is its own PID1 is the idea inside a Docker container. And therefore, when that PID1 goes away, right, the whole thing goes away, minus the zombie processes, which you might have to worry about. But this sort of thing has always been, has been part of the Linux architecture for a long time. Docker made it easy. You could do all this programmatically through your own script. You could just knock out these files all individually. Or you could just say Docker build, Docker run. So that's why Docker kind of made this so popular. Now, this is kind of what just the memory looks like. So if you actually go in there and ls, you know, uh, sysf, fs, C group memory, right? You will see all these files. The most interesting one in my mind, and specifically the one Docker is manipulating, is its memory limit and bytes is the interesting one, as well as the uh, swap space. Okay, so those are the two that are most interesting in that particular directory, but there's a bunch of settings you can actually make. But Docker's only manipulating a few of these, at least the ones I've found so far, and either in documentation or through experimentation. Okay, now, if you're gonna do this Docker thing, you don't wanna end up in this kind of scenario. One Docker container per boat. And you don't necessarily want to have a boat that looks like this one, okay? So if you think of the underlying architecture that's going to run your Docker container, 
you don't really want to have you know, a nice capsizable boat. You actually want a solution but that actually manage all these containers. And so at Red Hat, we have been part of Google since the very beginning of Kubernetes. And so the, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, it's the whole idea behind it is you can run a cluster of containers around a network of nodes, and then the load balance across them. You get service discovery, things like that for free. And it just makes the management of that ecosystem vastly easier. We'll show you some demos of that too as soon as we get into it. Now, so how do you scale it? How do you do port conflicts? One thing I love showing people is I can run like five different JVMs all on 8080 on one laptop because Kubernetes is managing it for me. Okay, it's dealing with the port conflicts. You can basically manage it across multiple hosts. The way you manage it here is the same way you'd manage it across 20 different servers or 100 different servers, if that's what you want to do. And so it really helps you understand what it means to run the architecture in each Docker container. Because by default, if you're just doing Docker build, Docker run, you have to SSH into every machine and do Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. And when it dies, you've got to come back around, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. Or Kubernetes will do that for you. Okay? It has a liveness probe and a readiness probe. It'll ensure that container is always healthy and happy. If it needs to, it'll restart it automatically. And if it has to, based on memory constraints or CPU requirements, it'll move it to a whole new node in the network. It'll do all that for you automatically, and you don't have to think about it any longer. And so that's the, kind of the nice thing in this Kubernetes world. You don't want a nice cluster solution that looks like this. I thought this was a funny photo. You apparently don't. OK, we'll keep going. Now, so Kubernetes kind of gives you all this capability. It stands for helmsman in Greek. And it's specifically because it's the ship's captain, if you will. Right? Think of it as a container ship's captain. It is a container orchestrator. And again, it was inspired by all the Google technology. And like the Google guys like to say, they launch 2 billion containers a week. They think they know what they're doing in this particular category. All right, so that's why we work with them specifically on that. And Red Hat is the uh, largest contributor to Kubernetes and Docker outside of those primary organizations. All right, so the architecture might look something like this. And I've overlaid it also with some capabilities that OpenShift adds on top. OpenShift is our distribution of Kubernetes, but it specifically has a little routing layer. It's just HA proxy, right? It's not too crazy. And has a way to do builds, specifically really interesting ways to do builds. If you just have source code as an example, you can say, here's my POM XML my and my Java application, a nice Maven project, and it'll build it for you automatically, wrap it, and throw it into the actual Kubernetes backplane for you. So it's just, most of it actually is just playing Kubernetes, though. And one thing that's interesting about it is, if, again, if a node fails, it'll rebalance those and move those containers someplace else. And I say move, but it really just gives rebirth. Or re, you know, those things are born again someplace else. So it manages all that, and you don't have to think about it. It doesn't matter if it's a Node.js thing, a MySQL thing, a Tomcat thing, a JBoss thing. It just works. Okay. Now, here's why Java fails. These two lines of code right here blow you up. All right. By default, Java, built before the advent of containers, sees the entire host resources. So there's, here's the magic trick here. If I'm working on this laptop with my four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, that's what it sees. It thinks it has access to all four cores and all 16 gigs of RAM, even if it's constrained to one uh, CPU, one core, and one gig of RAM. It thinks it has access to all. And normally in a development environment, this does not bite you because you're just working locally. But as soon as you move it to the big node, let's say in a Kubernetes cluster, that has 64 cores and 128 gigs of RAM, it'll die. Okay. It'll over-allocate resources that it does not have. It'll specifically look at the constraints placed on it with Docker or Kubernetes. It's, they're the same. And it's the C groups controls. And C groups will say, hey, you just busted out your memory limit. We're killing you right now and shutting you down. What's even better is you don't even get logs out of it. OK? So we're going to show you that. So just watch out for these two particular things. You might be thinking, why well, never use those APIs? Well, that's probably true. You don't use those APIs. But a lot of people do, like Tomcat like Wildfly, like Vertex. These are the projects that we work on right? At, at Red Hat. These are the app servers, if you will, or application runtimes that specifically run your apps. They look at those things, and they would make bad decisions. Now, the real bad one is the memory. We'll focus more on memory. But CPUs also is jacked up, OK? Because what happens in the case of like Tomcat, it's going to start 200 threads by default. That's what it does. And it starts a bunch of other threads based on what it thinks the available cores are. Right? Or in the case of Wildfly, so if, like, if you look at NIO threads and other threads associated with the, the application container, it might launch dozens if not hundreds of threads thinking it has access to all 64 cores. So you give it one core constraint, and it has two or 300 threads running, that's not going to be too cool. Okay? It'll work more you know, often than not, but you've got a lot of contention going on. Okay? So you can, these links are all available to you. And I should have mentioned the, the links to all these slides was up at the front, a bit.ly link. 
I open source all the slides and all the demo scripts and everything, so all this is available to you. You can go look at these if you want. All right, now the JVM ergonomics makes certain decisions about its environment, right? It looks for the memory of the base, uh, of the base host, and that it includes like an uh, EC2 instance. So if you have a big EC2 instance, you go run it over there. It's gonna see, act, it's gonna see all the cores and all the memory. It's gonna also do certain just-in-time compiler uh, optimizations. It's gonna make the decision between client versus server mode. And you're probably writing server-side apps. You don't really wanna be a swing app, right, all of a sudden. And it'll make that decision for you, and you'll see it switch. And I think we can probably demo that. Uh, and of course, the garbage collector fundamentally changes how it behaves, depending on what constraints you put on it, okay? So don't just Java dash jar and your Spring Boot jar or Vertex jar. If you do, you're going to be in trouble. It's kind of my base principle here. You've got to know what these settings are, OK? Uh, so let's keep going. So on the memory side, you probably think in terms of heap. That's what most of us, at least me, I've been doing Java stuff since 1998 or 97. I think in terms of heap, I forget about the rest. Because as a programmer, you don't care, right? Turns out heap is approximately 50% of the memory used by Java, right? That's our rule of thumb, 50%, right? Your heap is about half. Everything else, you really don't have so much control of. Uh, for instance, the, the JRE itself has to be loaded. That C code has to be loaded in the memory and has to run. You also have like what used to be called perm gen space. Now it's called meta space. That, you know, if you guys run hibernate enough, you've, done, you've blown the perm gen a few times, right? That's a common thing to do in hibernate. Uh, your just-in-time byte code, uh, and actually some that are kind of weird is if you use NIO, that's using native memory, and a lot of people don't realize they're using native memory. And that's calculated differently. It's off heap, right? So you've got to realize, oh, I use a lot of NIO. Well, it's not heap anymore. So these kind of little things get you. One that's actually very interesting is the thread count. If you are launching hundreds of threads, even though you only have one core, you might actually have all these threads that really can't even be used, and on a 64-bit JVM, they take about one meg each. So you might have 200 megs in threads that can't even be hardly used, as an example. So you've got to think about these things. Okay? There is the max RAM, and I've been talking to the Java team specifically on that. You can set XMX to be a little bit smarter about it, or you can set max RAM to try to keep the whole thing constrained. Right now, based on the interactions I've had with them, is they think max RAM is probably safest. Or you can look at the memory available to you, and then divide it by half, and then say that's what you get for XMX, for your heap space. Is that cool? Okay? Are you bored yet? OK, we're, get, we're, get, we're going to pick up steam here. Um, all right, so let's look at this demo. Uh, I got my whole demo script here. We don't want the burning container ship, OK? So let's going to show you. I'm, I'm not going to try to confuse you with having memorized all this stuff. I don't have it all memorized. I'm going to copy and paste. I hope you guys don't mind, because it's, I have not slept nearly enough. So let's see here. I don't have anything running over here. What I have, whoop, wrong window. What I have is two different VMs representing two different Docker daemons. One has a real whole Kubernetes single node cluster inside it, and one is just a regular Docker machine. So they're both running on a virtual box. You can see right here. This one is basically one gig of RAM and two CPUs. This one is basically four gigs of RAM and two CPUs. And I, tr I purposely tried to set it up that way. One, that way I could run two clusters, if you will, simultaneously. Uh, and I can throw different containers at it and see what happens, okay? And you'll see that the behavior changes depending on what the host has in it. And that, that kind of blows your mind because you don't expect that, right? You think, oh, I put Docker constraints on it, and it blows out its Docker constraints. So let's actually get in here and show you some stuff. Okay, so I, uh, the script is also attached to the slides, so you guys can follow all these things yourself. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me see here. Let's go to this one, okay? Let's just do this one. Uh, I'm going to come up here. Okay, so right here you can see we have we said limited 200 megs and one CPU. Let's go in here and let's just do a free dash H, and it says, "Woo, you got a lot more than 200 meg." Okay, so by default, free does free is not container aware. So if you're using free, you're already messed up. Okay, and so you know so certain things within the operating system just don't work as expected. Where you actually have to look as under this thing. Uh, let's just go to it. FS. All right, C group. You got to look under here. So if I look under CPU, let's see here, and do a CPU CFS quota, quota, right? All right, and then we do period. It's basically one to one, right? You divide the quota by the period, you get one. That's one CPU. So you gotta know these kind of things. It's kind of weird, right? Uh, you also, if you look at memory, let's see if our memory came out okay, All right? So cat memory, limit and bytes, there we go. And 
you know, it's in bytes. So I always, I do this trick here, I just cheat. I know, I should just do the math in my head, but you know, I, so when you don't sleep much, you want to double check. All right, it's 200 megs. All right, that's kind of about right, okay? So that's kind of what this looks like now. Now, so let me come back to my notes over here. We're going to keep going, but now let's actually do this. Let's run a little Java program. Okay, so Java dash version. Let's see what we have here. Java C dash version. Okay, and do this. And, oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Can't put a direct file there. Okay, so Java C, test. And so we're just, it's just a little bit of Java code. You can see it's just those two uh, APIs, Java test. Yeah, there we go. It thinks it has access to 200, uh, you know, 200 megs of RAM for heap. It's calculating a quarter of available memory. So already it's picked a number that's too big. And it also picked all two CPUs that are available to that virtual machine. So this is where you're probably looking and go, oh, that looks okay. I think I'm okay. You're not okay. You're already in a big a bunch of trouble. <laughs> so you just don't realize it. So basically this calculation is about a quarter of what thinks the overall uh, memory is available to it, which it's not. It should be more like 40 than 240. Okay, and then of course it sees all the CPUs available. And again, I'll just go back to my virtual box here. You can see I gave this thing, this is the Docker daemon here, I gave it two CPUs. So it, if I'd given it eight, it would think it has all eight. Okay, so that's already a problem. Uh, let's go here. We did those. Now, if you actually just run these commands right here, you can kind of see the settings specifically. See, it says max heap is 240 meg, even though I said you're constrained to 200 meg. And guess what happens when you go beyond the limit? You get killed by the kernel. It whacks you. And you don't even know what happened. Okay? Uh, so you can, it did pick the client uh, architecture because of the constraints that I've already put on it, <laughs> right? Uh, as to, instead of server architecture. And actually, let's do this. While we're here, let's go back up here, just make sure we do the exact same thing in both cases. Let's look at the bigger VM. Uh, hopefully, does this show up nicely? Okay, it's a little bit low there. I, let me move this up a little bit. Okay, and Java version. Make sure we got the same version of Java, right? So we're dealing with the same version of Java there. And let's actually run our little piece of code just to be on, you know, we're going to do everything the same. Okay, dun, 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 and Java C, test. Java, test. All right, there we go. Now, see, this thing it thinks it has a lot more memory. Okay, because it does have more memory. <laughs> uh, this one specifically, if we look here, has the four gigs of RAM, okay? So it thinks it gets access to 800 meg, again, about a quarter. And if we come back over here and run the, the settings, look at the settings specifically, because that's where it gets interesting. And there we go. You can see there's the heap size, server VM in this case. Uh, and so you can kind of see the delta there, right? So client VM, but already it's already picked a number for heap that's too big. Okay, now you're probably thinking, oh, that can't be a big problem. And the weird part is sometimes it's okay. All right, so let's kind of come in here and check it out. So let's, you, this is another way for you to check your heap by using this technique, print flags final. And again, I can print flags final here. How much heap? All right, again, it's, the numbers are consistent there. That's good. But it gets a little bit stranger. Let's keep going here. Okay, uh, you can test different Linux distributions. I've tried a whole bunch of different ones. It's kind of make the point. But let's do this. Let's come over here and say Docker stats. Okay, you can see there is, um, we have one Docker container running right now, and you can kind of see what it's doing there specifically, but we're going to exit out of it. All right, that shuts it down. You see it's gone now, and then I'm going to exit out of this one. Okay, and I can run Docker stats here too. All right, so again, these are two different Docker environments I'm running. You can run as many as you have the ability for resources. In fact, Docker makes that super easy, right? You just simply set your environment variables, and these terminals have different environment variables, point to two different Docker daemons. Uh, and so you can see this one actually has, since it's my Kubernetes cluster is running inside it, it actually has a bunch of things already running there, okay? This other one just has nothing because it's just a simple daemon with nothing else around it. But let's come here and do this a little bit more interesting. Let's come up with something more fun, like let's run a whole app server with 50 megs of RAM, right? This is the JBoss app server, the open source JBoss app server. Let me try to run it. All right, here it comes. It's going, going. You can see we're reaching the capacity on memory, so it's still cruising and it's gone, okay? Killed. So you just died, and you may not know why. And you can, I know one person who actually just tried different numbers until it worked. <laughs> the problem is it won't work in production that way. 
because it's looking at the total heap size. You can kind of see it right here, right? Well, for one thing, this is the app server. It's basically saying I need 64 megs minimum on the heap, and heap is half of what total memory, so already it's well beyond the 50 we said and the constraint we placed on it, and then it says a maximum of half a gig. So just the app server, default app server configuration was already going to blow up the 50. And so, again, you can experiment with this, but you should just know that it's actually just pretty straightforward to know what these numbers are, okay? Uh, all you got to do is look in the C group settings, and you can see exactly what the numbers are. So it goes away. If you come over here and look at the logs, let's see if we can check out the logs. Okay, and right there, that's the same thing we saw from a log standpoint. So the good news, it died nicely enough, if you will, that we could see the logs. We can actually see that it exited right here, and it's... Uh, out of memory true, out of memory killed true. So at least you know what happened, okay? So that's a, that one's not too bad. So at least we kind of know what happened, uh, and, and it worked out. At least, you know, hopefully we understand why it worked out. Uh, but let's do this now. Let's run this one, okay? In this case, we're, well, no, actually, that, that'll run fine. Let's ignore that one. Let's actually show you one. A lot of people think, oh, it's an app store, it's too big. You don't want to use microservices with an app server, right? You want, you want to use these nice skinny little things like Spring Boot. So let's throw a Spring Boot application at it. So we're going to run this little Spring Boot application here. Uh, doo -doo -doo, which one of these things did I mess up here? Doo -doo, let's duck around IT, REM, name. What's that? I missed what? Docker. Oh, the Docker image. Yes, I grabbed the wrong line. I didn't grab both lines. Uh, dun, 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 dun. This is a problem when I can't actually see. So here's our little Spring Boot application. We're doing, again, the print flag, so you can see all that happening there. All right, our little Spring Boot application's up. There it is. You can see we gave it 150 meg memory limit. It's used 140 already just to get up. But we're OK. We're up. We're fine. OK, and it has a little API on it. Let's just go hit the little U, uh, endpoint. All right, it's running, in this case, my little Docker daemon's running on 103, and it's going to process. You can see it's getting, top, it's getting up there to the top of the memory, but it's working, OK? It ran up to 99.98%. It it's good. It actually responded correctly. So all this is is a little piece of Java code. And if you can see it right here, it's pretty straightforward. It's just using a standard Spring controller. It basically says, when you ask for memory, it's going to go out there and look at the max memory, that API we mentioned earlier that doesn't give you the right data. Right? It gives you what it thinks the host has. And we simply are just concatenating a string and filling up memory. That's all it is. Putting a lot of stuff in heat. But in this case, it worked out. And if, if you didn't know this, you probably think, oh, I'm good. I tested it. Send it to production. All right? It gets crazier. You might, and here's what's even stranger. All right? Let's, uh, let's actually kill that one. Okay? So again, that was 150 megs of RAM. So you're thinking, okay, workstation, 150 megs of RAM, fine. Production, your operator's going to think, oh, I need to give it more memory. After all, it is a production-grade server. Uh, and actually, let's come over here. I can run the same one here. Okay, so this is on our bigger virtual machine. And you can kind of see this guy, the 150 meg right there. Okay, it's running, 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 running. Looks okay. Oh, oh, come on. Okay, looks like it's going to settle and be okay there. Let's double check. Oh, I got killed. So the exact same command line that I ran fine on my workstation did not work in my production environment. Oh, we've got to go faster, don't we? Okay. All right. So that's, one, that's a simple example where you think you're okay and you're not okay. Uh, let's go over here and look at more of these things. The doo -doo 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 -doo. So we've got a bigger one here. And so here's the weird part. You think if you add more memory, you're still okay. Like in this case, instead of the 150, my operations people are going to go, oh, let's give it 300. We should be okay. Oh, I didn't grab the whole line, did I? All right. Okay, so you think you're now fine. I gave it 300 megs of RAM. And it actually does come up in this case and stays up. You can see right here, if you look at Docker stats, there's our 300 megger. Okay, it's, it's getting up to the top, but it's not busting out of its, uh, its memory limit so far. And okay, looks like it's okay. So now my user is going to use it. So my user comes over and hits it. This is running on 107. All right, different VM. All right, so it's trying to hit it, and it goes boom and dies. So again, these, the, these things are kind of simple, but it does get you into some trouble. And the worst part is now I don't even have my Docker logs to look at, right, in this case. Uh, so the thing is just completely gone, and I can't come in here and say, uh, what do we call that container? We call that container, uh, my container 300, you know, 
Docker logs, my container 300. It's just gone. I don't know what happened. So this is the magic trick that hopefully this whole presentation is about. But let's, we, it could go on and on and on. Let's show you some more of this, OK? So you think you can, you know, again, you can, your logs are gone. You might want to run it a different way. You can just set your Java options to actually fix the XMX command. That helps you. But keep in mind, it's approximately half of the total available memory. What you're better off doing is doing something like this, OK? And actually, this is where it will fail again. Let's see if we can show you another fail, OK? So here you can see, again, I said constrain it to 100 megs of RAM. It thinks it has 241 that it can use. If I come over here and run it, same command. Uh, again, it thinks it has eight, oh, you know, close to a gigabyte it can use. Again, about a quarter of the host it calculates for heat. So again, 100 meg was its limit. And C groups will kill it once you go beyond your limit. OK? So that's one thing to keep in mind there. If we come over here and unlock experimental options, though, Okay, this is new in 131, right? So uh, OpenJDK 131. We worked on this specifically with Oracle. It got backported from Java 9 to Java 8. That's awesome. And it's an experimental option, though. You have to unlock the experimental option. And then if you run that, you can see it's now 48. So what was originally 241 is now 48. That's the maximum heat you can get in a 100, megabit, 100 megabyte limit. Okay, if I run it over here, I can see that it calculates 44 here. It even went smaller. <laughs> so this is a subtle thing, but if you don't know that, you're going to basically over-allocate heat, OK? So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's keep coming back over here. Um, what else can we show you here? Oh, let's do this real quick, because this is interesting. Let me run this one, OK? Let's go to sysfs, C group, OK? Uh, CPU. So in this case, we set the CPU, and I said I want 1.25. This is actually new in Docker 1.13, so it actually works kind of oddly. But if I come here and say cat CPU and CFS quota, quota, all right, you can see there's the 125. And then the, you, you divide it by the period, OK? All right? And that's basically 1 tenth of a second, by the way. The 100,000 is a 1 tenth of a second. And you divide those two numbers, and it's 1.25 CPUs, approximately. I know that's kind of strange, but that's, that's how it works, OK? Uh, and I have all of these examples, because one thing that's actually kind of unusual about this uh, you can test it with a piece of Java code that's what we have there. But the one that you really need to focus on is this one, because this is the one Kubernetes uses if you use a Kubernetes cluster to manage your Docker containers. So Kubernetes basically has the kubelet, which runs out on all your nodes. It does your Docker, uh, it connects to your Docker and runs it for you automatically, right? It, you, it hits the date API directly. But you then have to look at these kinds of things. And then you would look at these C groups controls specified right here. And so I just kind of show you how to cat them out. Again, you can run it with a piece of Java code to verify them. And the last thing I would show you is run this piece of code right here, because it'll also tell you exactly how many CPUs do you think you have. So if I come over here now and exit it out, run this one, OK? And then let's run this one right here, OK? It will tell us it still thinks we have two CPUs. So this is the fixed version. It only has one, OK? <laughs> so. It, there, there are going to be situations where we still are telling you you have too many processors available to you. That just is not quite right at this point. Uh, the only way to get that to be quite right is to use CPU sets or CPU pinning. And if you actually say you're allowed one CPU here, CPU zero, you can, it'll work. It'll actually tell you you get one core. Available processors from Java will actually respect that. Uh, the downside is the kernel does pin you to that core. You can't run another core. And here's what's really bad in a clustered situation. If you actually didn't take this Docker container and run it across a bunch of different nodes, everyone else might be on uh, CPU 0 also on that node. And now you've got all this contention on a single CPU, which might be a 64-core box. Okay? So I don't recommend doing this one, though this is the one that works properly with Java. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Okay? This was the one, and this is the one that Kubernetes uses. So this, I just got tons of examples in here. You guys can certainly follow that. Uh, but let's actually just kind of finish up a few more things here before we run out of time completely. OK, there are some workarounds that we provide. There's specifically a Docker image, a base Docker image that you can get out there from Fabricate, the Fabricate project. It has a nice script inside it that does all kinds of clever things. If you remember the memory limit in bytes, also the CPU calculations, the division that has to happen there, it does all that math for you. And it then sets the appropriate JVM parameters for you. So you hopefully don't bust out your limits. You should still test all these things, because it's an imperfect science. But you at least have the ability to kind of run with a base image that works. Also, we showed you the patched uh, 8U131. 
So if you use the experimental options, it does calculate heap vastly better than it did before, and that does work. Uh, and you can actually go to the bug, read about it. You'll see a person from Red Hat who suggested the idea. Okay? You can also do things like this um, right here, unlock experimental options. That's the C group testing. I put all this in the slides so you guys have for your own you know, review later on. You can just try those things. When it comes to cores, keep in mind there's four ways Docker can constrain cores. This is the newest one. That's not, again, not the one Docker, uh, Kubernetes supports. Kubernetes focuses on this one. But so one, one and a half core, one and a half core, one and a half core. These are all approximately one and a half core, okay? Uh, and this one is just two cores because it's zero and two. It skips one, okay? It does assume you have two cores at least on the machine you run this thing on. It will bounce you out if you ask for cores that don't exist. It will give you an error, okay? Uh, so just keep that in mind. That's how the CPUs are set. The good news about the CPUs is it doesn't normally blow up like heap consistently blows up like you saw it do earlier. The core thing just, you know, you're over allocating threads is the biggest problem, okay? Now, from a Java standpoint, these are some recommendations. If you did say two CPUs here, do change your parallel GC threads. If you do this manually, do change your parallel GC threads to two. In other words, those should be even numbers approximately, if it's four and four, or six and six, two and five and five, whatever it might be. Also, your concurrent GC threads, try to keep those fairly even. Look at your fork join pool also, make that about the same number also. Because what you don't want is you know, 15 threads running on a two core machine. And of course, you know, not getting a lot of context switching. And your max RAM is the one we're looking at as a recommendation there. Now, if you have this other situation, Right here, you can kind of see where we have the CPU quote and CPU. That's, again, about one and a half core. Um, that's, if you're below two, just go with a serial GC, okay? You don't want parallel, <laughs> parallel GC when you don't even have cores to run them on, okay? So in that case, we recommend using the uh, parallel GC. And of course, I did, in this case, I set the heap to approximately half. Um, again, the CPU set, the pinning of CPUs was also patched, but Kubernetes is not using it, so you have to think about do you want to take advantage of that or not, okay? So, uh, how many more minutes do we have? Seven. Okay, we got enough time to show you the, the uh, Kubernetes thing. Okay, all right. And I want to just show you the Kubernetes thing. I have this kind of scripted out to make it a little bit easier for myself. But let's see here. Let's see. Do I have any do I have pods running? No pods running. So, this is just a quick Kubernetes thing, right, to kind of see what that is. Um, I can create the namespaces. So, that's kubectl get namespaces. I have a Java demo that I've already created out there. And then I can do this, right? So I can say, I, I don't need to create namespace. I can do a create Docker image. I already have the Docker image. I don't need to create that. So let's do, let's get rid of that. And let's do a four, okay? So that's gonna basically create the pod from the Docker image. So the Docker daemon has the Docker image in it. And the pod basically wraps that Docker image and runs it in Kubernetes. This is what the command looks like. You can see it dash F YAML. If we look at that YAML file right here, here it is. Here's where we specifically asked for it's resources, so it's requesting this level of resources so the scheduler knows to put it on a server, a node that actually has that available resources. And here's the hard limits. Those are the C groups limits. Just like you saw in the Docker examples, these are the same thing, right? It's the same C groups limits, and therefore if you go beyond them, you get killed. The same kind of thing as you saw before. Uh, nice thing about Docker to our Kubernetes is you have the concept of the readiness probe and liveness probe. Uh, but that pod should be up by now since I talked long enough, so let's go over here and see. Yep, it's ready, one for one. And so I can do some fun stuff with this, okay? Let's look at the C group stats specifically on it. So here, I basically have a 400 meg limit. I have one for one, that's one CPU. And then I have a 256 on the CPU shares. Uh, so uh, this, if you're using CPU shares, that's approximately a quarter of a CPU, all right, in that specific case. Um, so that's kind of how it's configured. So you can actually see, I just went right in there to that container and looked at the actual C groups system to see what it was actually set. So this is what you'll want to do to really know that you got what you want out of the thing and the kernel won't kill you, okay? Uh, let's see what else do we have here, all right? I can uh, exec into it and then I can do stuff inside it, right? That's nice. Uh, so again, I can just do, do dot version here. All right, we're not gonna mess with that any longer, but let's come over here and you can expose that service or to have the service and now it's actually available on port 80 and available to me. So if I did that correctly, I haven't actually thought to look at this in a while. And come over here, all right. And we're about down to five minutes. Um, and what is my IP address for that? I know, I know, I know, I know. I think I said it was 107. Okay, well, oh, I don't have a route, I have a service. So let's do this. I can curl it from here. So it basically I'm hitting the node port. 
you can kind of see that's the Java API again. It's basically saying, oh, it thinks it has 178 megs of RAM and two cores again. So again, Java thinks it has access to more than it really does, okay, by default. So that's just a little Vertex application. I can show you the code. It's pretty straightforward. And what else we have here? So let's, and you can, we can just delete it, and I can just redeploy it, right? So if I want to come over here now and say, oh, I really want to give you access to more of one and a half CPUs and maybe, you know, 300 megs of RAM is the limit, I can just redeploy that, okay? And now it's going through its recreation process. So just keep in mind that that's where all the magic happens. It's in the C group specifically itself. And let's kind of go back to the slides here and kind of wrap this thing up, okay? So some key tips for you guys to remember. Hopefully you enjoyed this particular session, but look at the Fabricate-based image as one that kind of has the scripting, does all this kind of automatically for you. You don't have to have 8.131, uh, right, specifically, which does fix some things. It actually figures it out through a script. You can actually read the script online. There's also a cool Maven plugin that we provide that actually does the wrapping for you automatically. You just say setup, and it'll actually embed itself. It'll edit your POM XML, essentially, and then deploy. And it deploys it automatically to Kubernetes or OpenShift, as an example, doing the Docker build for you automatically. So the Fabricate Maven plugin makes life a lot easier. Uh, and then I have all these different resources you should be aware of. One is the slide deck at that bit.ly link. You can get access to it and join me here, right? You'll see you join this Google Doc. It's just the Google Doc. You can save it off into your own uh, directory and keep going. The thing I was using specifically is called the CDK. So it basically, it's a Kubernetes cluster in a single node on your laptop, right? And that's what I was using in that one VM there. We call it MiniShift or the MiniShift CDK. It's specifically, in this case, running on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you truly can have a production-like environment locally to try things with. Right? You've got the right version of the operating system with the right version of everything to try things with. Uh, that's available for download. The uh, Kubernetes demo is in this particular GitHub repository. There's so very cool blogs we've written to talk about these issues of CPU and memory specifically. Uh, there's also a great one on DZone that just came out recently, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so all the examples you saw me run are basically listed here or we've talked about all these things. Uh, and I know we're down to like one minute. Is there any, any one, two questions that you might have? Did I talk too fast? Was this interesting at least? Okay, so I want, you know, I'll be available after the fact, but uh, any question? I can't see very well. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, as far as you know, is Java 9 working on it? Yeah, well, the same fixes that are in uh, 8, 1, 3, 1 that uh, you saw me do are in Java 9 too. But it's the exact same thing. The only difference is the way the calculations are done. You'll see a little bit less heap uh, available in Java 9 as an example, just slightly less. So the, the mathematics are different, but otherwise it works the same. Uh, so it was in Java 9 backported to 8.131. So if you look at those two bugs I listed there, you'll see that's what they did. Okay, if you have any specific questions, feel free to see me after the session. Again, hopefully you enjoyed it. It's the first time I've actually run this, and so obviously my tie-in wasn't exactly right. But again, you have access to all this documentation for you to go try it on your own. And I'd encourage you to do so because it's really cool what you can do with Docker and Kubernetes, even on a single laptop. And you can validate all these same theories because that's all I did for the last several days, is run test after test after test. Okay? Thank you guys so much for your time. And maybe I'll see you later for the reactive session we'll be doing. We have some fun online games to play there. Okay, thank you. <laughs>